Um, thank you very much, Dr. Merman, for your gracious introduction, and thank you all very much for your heartwarming applause. It's an honor to be here in Copenhagen today and speak before Global Response 2010. Uh, just like uh, Ms. There you go. Uh, I'd like to express my utmost gratitude to the University of Health Sciences in Copenhagen, as well as my own home institution of Sebi University School of Medicine. Um, considering my account, um, I'd like to give some background on Kashmir. Like most of the conflicts to be discussed can't really be condensed into a few sentences, but the crux of the problem lies in the idea, widely believed in both India and in Pakistan, that Kashmir is the birthright, its exclusive birthright of, of one country. While India views the profound historical and cultural links between the erstwhile Himalayan kingdom and Delhi as, it, as the basis of its claims, Pakistan sees Muslim-majority Kashmir as the completion of its Islamic ideology. It sees it, it as a natural extension of its Islamic ideology, in fact. Uh, the imposition of these competing national visions and myths upon Kashmir is what has caused much of the problem. In the past 60 years, there has been an arbitrary division of the state. There have been four bitterly fought wars between India and Pakistan, and a 20-year-old insurgency supported by Pakistan and aided by a large proportion of Kashmiris. But what is the birthright of the Kashmiris? Both Indians and Pakistanis are quick to speak on their behalf telling the world what they think Kashmir wants. But even the most sincerest attempts usually introduce some sort of bias. From what I have seen and heard in Kashmir, the people desire the same birthright that all other people would like, among them, justice, security, and peace. Yet over the past 21 years, they have seen all three disappear in the crossfire between terrorist and security forces, both of whom engage in gross human rights violations. Our place, as doctors and future doctors, is not to advocate one side over another, but rather to promote good health and in the process, empower the people themselves in their struggle for the rights denied to them. Mental health is, the, is an essential but often overlooked component, and the rehabilitation of the victims of violent conflict should coincide with the treatment of more visible physical wounds. I had the opportunity to see this firsthand at the Psychiatric Diseases Hospital in, in Srinagar, the, the summer capital of the state. There I met a young lady, Sakina Syed, who had unwittingly become a victim of the conflict. She bore no scars, bruises, or any other physical wounds, but had the frightening nightmares, flashbacks, and overwhelming anxiety associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. She had witnessed the murder of her own brother by an errant bullet. She didn't know who killed him, and she didn't quite care about that. The point is that she was debilitated, horribly so, and her story is not unique at all. It is repeated all throughout the Valley of Kashmir and throughout the world. And unfortunately, uh, many of the times, these victims are not given the proper aid that they need. Studies estimate that one out of six Kashmiris suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, drug abuse, depression, and suicide also occur at shockingly high rates, although epidemiological studies have been lacking in the last decade. Complicating the solution is a lack of awareness and stigma associated with psychiatric disease. Mental illness is often perceived as a spiritual malady and is so often suppressed and concealed rather than being actually treated. Even after identification, those who are affected prefer visiting faith healers for fear of being somehow associated with the government that sponsors the hospital. The hospital uh, has the highest priority of preventing such diseases from occurring and treating those people who are affected, but it's not their only concern. Poor health, particularly mental health, perpetuates the conflict itself. Untreated mental illness, along with the associated frustration and helplessness, breeds um, radicalization and furthers the conflict itself. But its more subtle effects can also be felt as you travel through the valley. Widespread illicit drug abuse furthers the hands of smugglers and other criminal elements associated with the terrorists. <clears throat> and economic productivity is often sacrificed in people tending to their own wounds. A special concern is for the children. Sakina must have only been three or four at the time. She was denied the, the happy and secure childhood that every parent would want for their child. And uh, this is a very common story throughout all of Kashmir. At the risk of sounding pessimistic, this seems to be the first of only many years of insurgency in Kashmir. There are very few signs of its abatement, and patients will likely to continue to pour into the psychiatric diseases hospital for the foreseeable future. For these reasons, the government of Jammu and Kashmir should strongly consider increasing funding for the hospital and establishing other psychiatric facilities. There are indications that, that this is all, already in the works. The big issue, however, is how the lessons of the last 20 years in Kashmir can be applied towards uh, our work throughout the rest of the world. Undoubtedly, psychiatric services need to be expanded and made available throughout all conflict zones. Culturally sensitive psychiatrists need to be trained and ought to give due priority to those traumatized by conflict. 
Its national organization should also strive to increase their visibility to reduce the stigma. Doctors Without Borders is doing so in, in Srinagar itself. And just as with the humanitarian crisis, it would be advisable to provide counseling and psychosocial support to family members at the time of the trauma. Certainly an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. One last note on Kashmir. If and when a political resolution is reached and the guns finally do fall silent in Kashmir, its culture will have been irrevocably damaged. The romantic allure of Kashmir, picturized in countless Hindi films and immortalized in the poems of Hindu and Muslim saints alike, will be all but gone, a shimmering distant memory akin to King Arthur's Camelot. If there is any hope for Kashmir to return to what it once was, and if there is any hope for Kashmir to become a bridge of friendship and understanding between these two nations, it will require a self-confident population, unfettered by the violence of the past two decades. In short, the type of peace needed in Kashmir is not the type that can be proclaimed on paper by governments and guerrillas. No, the type of peace that Kashmir and the rest of the world needs is the peace of mind that arises out of a genuine desire for communal harmony and self-respect. Our generation of global doctors can aid them tremendously in this regard. We can extend our services to help heal those profound wounds, both physical and mental, and in the process, restore the dignity of those who feel degraded by violence. Let us dedicate ourselves to helping the victims of violent conflict worldwide. Let us dedicate ourselves to helping them reclaim those long-lost cherished birthrights, security, justice, and peace. Thank you. Peace throughout Kashmir and peace throughout the world.